السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا هلا ومرحبا أرحبوا حياكم الله هلا والله أرحبوا مليون آه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على حبيبنا ونبينا وقاتلنا وسيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد uh, first of all I would like to, I would like to welcome you all thank you so much for coming tonight and the first the first thing what I said was the Yemeni greetings and some of you are familiar with it like a piece from Yemen uh, first of all before I start I would like to send a message to our brothers and sisters in Gaza we are with you we will never forget you and wallahi 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 you will emerge victorious I can tell you this, this is an answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا مُسْلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Brother, <laughs> the orange color, in short words, you know, it's a message in both sides to the Americans. I see that this is the orange suit I used to wear in Guantanamo, the orange cloth, the actual one. And this is the one. This one. So I managed, alhamdulillah, to get it out. The orange is a victim of American justice. And to have justice to this color, we have to bring this to our side and this color we have to wear. Not just that, it's a message to Americans. No matter what you did, no matter how many prison, prison you uh, created, no matter how many pro torture programs you develop, you will never break us. You will never defeat us. Regardless, we are, we are among the world with our humanity, with our belief, with our values. If the moment you say, oh, the orange color, I cannot look at it, you are known to defeat. I'm not going to give him this. I wore orange every single day. It's my color. Or orange is my number. So what? And today, I guess I celebrate today that <laughs> Ron DeSantis <laughs> <laughs> out of the presidency race. So this is the story with the orange color because the war in terror hasn't ended yet or the war in Muslims. And we haven't finished with Guantanamo. For us Guantanamo, well, I'm gonna talk about that, but we still go. So I, I'm free. I was free all the time. Even in Guantanamo, I was free. But now the orange it is a symbol of resistance, a symbol of seeking justice. We're here to talk about your book. So our book. Our book. Your book, mashallah. Why is why is it called Don't Forget Us Here? <clears throat> you know when I started in 2010 writing the book was in Arabic, uh, I thought at that time I said I need to write something different. It's not about me. It's never about me. So I had to try something about the prison stories about the brothers, the guards, the Guantanamo, <coughs> the animals. In Guantanamo, it was life, love, death, hope, you know, good moment, bad moment. So it was moments from Guantanamo, always. Then the last day, when I left Guantanamo, brothers used to say, I'm going to say, I come to see Victoria Garden. And they said, Please don't forget us here. And this we choose to make the, the book. It was a message from me. So that book is not my book. It's our book. It's about us all. I'm just the man who carried the message. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's, I guess, I, I, I feel the sense of that. I feel the sense of, of burden and responsibility whenever we meet, whenever we speak. Um, what really comes from you, even though it's always done in a, in a very happy and jovial way, like, which is your character, but behind that smile, I always sense that, that deep burden that you feel for the brothers that are left behind. And I, I, know, I know that's the case, because I don't think I've ever had a conversation with you where you haven't mentioned the name of somebody that's still left behind where you're always talking about them, talking about their cases. We could be talking about anything from food to sleep patterns 
to books and you were reminding me of the story of someone else. And I find that, I find that really remarkable. And I guess another remarkable aspect of your, your, your story, your case in your life is that you're among a few um, individuals that were effectively teenagers. You know, many of the men were already in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, even up to uh, till 70s. 105 years old. 105, of course, yes, one of the first to be released. Yes. Um, but there was Muhammad al Gharani, who they say was around 13, 14. He was also 10 and 12. 10 and 12? Yeah. How interesting. In, in, in total, there was around 60 children. 60. The youngest prisoner was... was sorry, uh, I'm yeah. going to finish the question and I'll come I'm back sorry. to you. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I won't be able to hear. You were 18 when you were first arrived in Guantanamo. What does it mean to be somebody that young um, in, an, in a prison environment with people who are, in many ways, so much older than you? Don't say a boy, please. Sorry? Don't say a boy. So I, I shouldn't say boy or child, yeah. <laughs> first of all, before I answer that question, around 779 men have left Guantanamo. Men and children, there was around 60 children. The youngest was three months old, the oldest was 105 years old, 15 nationalities, more than 20 languages spoken at Guantanamo. All kind of mindset. Uh, if you were Pakistan, you'll be my neighbor at Guantanamo. So, you know, we are different from the, the new generation now. The way where I was, uh, where I was, where I was born, the way I was raised. So the sense of being a man in my life was at 12, 12 years old. So in our uh, families and communities, we were raised in a way to be the face of the family and man of the tribe. And our, uh, my, especially my father would let us engage in everything. Come here, listen to this uh, reconciliation, just to be with ask us, discuss us with this. So basically, men and women in the family. So when you tell people to me, I used to, when I used to work in the security company at, uh, at eight, at 18, uh, Dutch embassy, the wife of the council would say, you are a boy. I said, no, I am a man. <laughs> so people, you know, like, have the sense that of uh, you know, the behavior and everything. Actually, the, the people you are interact with you know, the environment, it shaped you that way. So nowadays, I can see 20 is still like the mentality of a child, right? So at that age, I came from young tribal community, moved to the city the first time, you know, in Sana. I grew up in a rural, a rural uh, village in the mountain. We had no electricity, no TVs, nothing. We go to the school at early age, you know, walk 12 kilometers back and forth, a lot of walking, sometimes without shoes because my sister would have no shoes as punishment. <laughs> she loves me, but when I drive her crazy, she would, you know, and I have to go to, to school. Uh, sometimes she would hide them in her bag. She, when I come back, she would give it to me. <laughs> a lot of stories and those kind of memories. When I finished my secondary school, I moved to the city. Now I could see a lot of buildings, electricity. I used to go to behind the TV to check what was behind the TV was going on there. So, yeah, um, it is totally different from nowadays. And uh, one of the questions that I was asked in an interview that really shocked me. Someone asked me, how did you spend your 20s? I said, what? And that really like the first time I, I never thought about 20s or 20 whatsoever. I was sold to the CIA at the age of 18. Came from Guantanamo at 33. And there is no 18, there is no, no you, you lose a sense of time right. in the prison. In the same circles, go out with the same people, and, and, and so on. So there is no sense of, uh, of time. When I came out from Guantanamo, out of Guantanamo, uh, there was a huge gap in my life, 15 years. Uh, mentally, you can see if you, if you interact with this child, she might be heavier. That's normal because I was 15 years, almost when I got out, almost half of my life. I remember when I went to the faculty, the college, I, I could see those students, 19, 20, they keep their distance. 
I was like, I asked my professor, what's the O? She said, not super girl. Oh, I'm not O. I thought we were the same age. So, because nobody tells you, and you just interact with you, you think you're the same, the same mentality. Sorry, talking a lot. No, subhanAllah, I'm really glad that you shared that. Um, I think it's something really important for us to reflect on as well, that question, um, what did you do with your 20s? If I, if I start thinking about my, my 20s, like, you know, I finished my degree, did my master's, got married, wrote a book. Like, there are things that I can attach to my 20s, right? But, and that, that's a question for all of us, too, that we should be asking ourselves when we think about these prisoners and what they go through, because time stops for them. So for Mansoor, from 18 to 33, time stopped. It was the same routine, day in, day out. Obviously, you're making life very difficult for your prison guards, making hell for them. But you know, other than you know, making life extremely difficult for his torturers, um, you know, there was a monotony to his existence. Um, something for us to be thankful for when we think about you know, the relative freedom that we've grown up with. One of the great moments in your book for me, sorry, was um, I'm so used to other brothers who were released much earlier than me, spending time with them, talking to them, and we talk about the literature they would read and they would all reference Harry Potter. But you had been in prison for 15 years. And so when I read your book, you were talking about Hunger Games. And it actually gave me such a profound sense of how much time had shifted that the early books that were written by the released detainees were all talking about, yeah, I read the Harry Potter books and I was desperate to read the next one. But your book started referencing Hunger Games and it gave me a real perception shift of the time that you were there. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, were there any other books that you really enjoyed? Um, because, I mean, of course you talk about Hunger Games, but there must have been others too. Uh, I would like to welcome my also colleague and friend, brother, Tarek and Abdullah. They were also from Hunger Games too. So, in the early days, you know, I remember the first time they bought the book and we rejected it from the asteroid. Those books, more trash books. You know, it's again, go against everything. I think you know what I'm talking about here. And it was intentionally to destroy it. So we rejected it. And brothers, remember, we weren't allowed to have access to books. Tafsir uh, Nakabir, Sahih Muslim, was, designed, was classified as a terrorist material. In, uh, in uh, So uh, for us, we were in the level that we would get books or pens and so on. Later on, when we negotiated with the administration, at least if you, the book, sometimes the interrogators would come negotiate with you, like a really good scan for you know, to talk to you. And they said, the price we have to pay always for medicine, for books, for anything. So when, when this, uh, the situation changed and came the after when Obama signed an executive order to close Guantanamo and failed, they, they, they knew that the need of improving the living condition in the camp. This was really bad. We shared with, the, with, with, with them this family story. I would get access to books, to newspaper, you know, TVs, uh, videos, and so on. The first book, I, when I started learning English, it was Around the World in 80 Days. So I would go to the guards, hey, can you teach me English? Yes, no, fuck off, whatever. So sorry for the effort. So then the girls and the brothers, Mansoor, we are going to finish the book, next month. And I had like a pen, right? I didn't have dictionary, borrowed from different place. So we are going to finish the book. I said, we're gonna find my sweetheart. Because the guy in the book eventually you know, found a woman and get married, whatever. So then I had a lawyer, an Irish, uh, American Irish lawyer. And I told me, the first time he came, we were communicating through a interpreter. When I start learning English, I think it took me one year. One year later when he came, he said, look, today I didn't have an interpreter, but I will try to communicate. I said, look, I can't speak English. He was like, are you serious? I said, yeah. He shook my hand, so happy. He said, okay, I told him, send me books, uh, send me books, dictionaries, and, and I get the Hunger game. So I, I read the book, the first one. Send the second one the letters. I need to select the third. Then I get the audio, uh, listen to it. Read them again. I noticed one day I have conversation with the interrogators. I said, 
You know when, when the Islamic game, the, the second one, how the, 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 the arena for the, 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 those kids, like every hour there's something came, that came up. Guantanamo was designed the same way. Every month there's a major problem in the camp. Either like secretion of the Quran, mother prayers, cell searches, beatings with the food, with the medicine. So in, in short words, Guantanamo mission was experimenting on the prisoners. And if you <coughs> if you go to the research that was published by uh, Seattle Home Law University called uh, Guantanamo America's Battle Lab. Guantanamo America's Battle Lab. That research, can, uh, uh, lawyers, psychologists, and contributed to the to the research how the American military turned Guantanamo and experimenting life on prisoners. And yeah. Dr. there's something very bizarre about reading dystopian fiction in a dystopian prison. Um, there's something like so insane about that, it's hard to actually imagine. And, that, and the fact that you guys were enjoying this literature and wanted more of it. No, <laughs> it makes it, makes it even more no, bizarre. It was, no, it, it was like, you feel you are, you are being the, one of the boys in this game. Right. So when last, later on when I went through the PRP, like periodic review board, actually a military uh, commission where they, to be clear, to be to, for at least, like high agencies, uh, Department of the Justice, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, FBI, CIA. So, in order to leave Guantanamo, you have to participate. You have to go through the process. You have to play their game. So, uh, and in the Hunger Game, I remember when, ha when uh, Katniss told Heinrich, I don't want to play, to be the capital part anymore. And he told her, look, the only way to go out of open, to go through it. And I told my wife, look, the only way to go out of Guantanamo to go through the process, regardless. So they have to, if, it doesn't matter. They, that process has, have, has no legal basis, but you have to go through it. And you have to, you know, it, it also, it, 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 it's, it's changed from administration to another. I don't go deep because I cannot shut up, so. No, no, no. no we, can, we can listen to you all night. Um, <laughs> now I'm glad I asked you that because it's such an interesting re series of reflections, you know, how, how you guys are relating to, to the world and even to the world of fiction, you know, in the, even in the circumstance that you're in. There's a couple of passages in the book that stood out for me more than, more than any others and I, I, I focused on them in a review that I wrote of your book. The one, one of them happens early on in your detention. And I'm sure this happened a few times across your detention period, but what happens almost near the end, and I want to read the passage out to you and then get your reflections on it. You write, this is when an interrogator has come to you, near the end of your detention period, and you, you describe this scene. He said, in exchange for my cooperation, so he's making you an offer here, they would relocate me to a Western European country where I get citizenship, a generous house, a college education, a car and $150,000. They said they would re relocate my mother, my father, and my youngest siblings there too. I would disappear so that no one would ever be able to find me and that I would be safe. I'd heard the, br the brothers talk about such deals, but I always thought they were fake. Believe me, I wanted all those things. I wanted to be free and to see my family. I had left my home when I was 13 so that I could get an education and one day take care of my mother and father when they were older. This was my dream, the dream that had first brought me to Sana'a and then to Afghanistan. And in exchange for all this, all I had to do was identify a man I didn't know. I cannot, I said. I couldn't lie. It's forbidden in Islam. It's against everything that I fought for. It's against everything that I am. After 15 years, when I, when I read that passage in particular, I was thinking to myself, if I had been detained in Guantanamo for 15 years, I'm not sure I'd have that, the strength of character to say no to them. I think you would spit on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. You know, actually, like, the question for all of us, 
like, and you can, I will answer it, like, what makes you who you are, a unique individual person? Because we all have the same hardware, but our DNA also is different. But for me, the way Guantanamo understood it, what makes us as a unique human being different, the uniqueness one, is those traits. Your faith, value, morals, ethics, religion, language, emotion, relationship, memories, experience, knowledge, name, language, right? So this is the package we brought with us to Guantanamo. We were stripped naked the moment we arrived, like all of us. Those are, that also, these were also our survivors kept at Guantanamo. Why well, I'm saying that, now you're being test tested. My faith, my childhood, my education, my memories play an important role in my survival at Guantanamo. At that, at that place, you know, it brought us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muslims. You know, I could go on and on and on. But I always told my brothers, everything in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless. You know, but we know that the hadith, وَعَلَمْ أَنِّ الْأُمَّةِ لَوْ اجْتَمَعَ الْمَلَاءُ مُتَلَقُ بِشَيْءٍ You can take it from there. So, after years and years and years, imagine someone kidnap, imprison, torture, abuse you, day and night, your brother, and so on. And in the end, and you know, they are wrong. And then you are afraid to take it to hell. Sounds sweet, right? I wanted all of that, but not that way. So when they came to me, they said, you know, if you help us to witness again that person, you will get that deal. I said, no, simple as that. And when that happened again, we're going to talk about it later. You know, why I said, why I said no? Because I have a knowledge of my religion. I know what, what, what I went through there. Also in the personal level, I would never do that. If we come from from like from a place where we raise us have this kind of morals and ethics, but also based on our faith, our religion, you know the moment you said yes, the moment you sign and so sell yourself with people, alhamdulillah, I never even have a second thought about it. Never even like, oh, I wish no, no, that's it. That strength it wasn't from me or all of us. I think you can ask the brothers here. We all felt that there was something beyond our capabilities. There was Sakina, like calmness. And I come to you, you know, one time it's not just bleak side. It was like a beautiful moment. We celebrate, we dance, we put with the God, we cried, we laugh. We have uh, fake marriages, we have a lot of fun there. As fun. <laughs> you know? So I wrote an article called The Beautiful Guantanamo. Alhamdulillah, the brother, <coughs> well, the friendship we have here, it brought us closer to ourselves, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I studied Aqidah and I studied knowledge and religion, but I never understood it the way I come to live it there. One of the moments I can tell you, I studied riba, riba to riba, meaning to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, satisfaction, work. And I know that, I know what the riba is. I studied that. But to live it, I didn't know. One day I was in solitary confinement, uh, isolation of life in Dhaka. That's it, that my thoughts. You know, feeling like angry and this patience, what you didn't have. I don't know what's wrong with this. Something in my chest. And I said, Allah, I'm in control and I'm in control. The moment I said that, like the, there is like a mountain shaking from my, my chest. I just is so calm. And sometimes you have patience, but you are not sad. You are not just in the to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that moment, we started also praying, fasting. Then it gave you some boost, like pulling you to push it forward. I remember one day, I was, I think, 20 years old. And I, was in, I was in the interrogation room. And then interrogators came. You know, take my clothes, you know, cold water. He said, you will, make, you will never make this place safe. Your, your file, your case is on the desk of our prison, Dr. Bush. <laughs> you know, as at that time, I was young, 
net na het spelen zo. Ik was echt onder happy. En ik toonde hem, do you think that your president gets the area where he really controls his body? I'm like, I said the word literally, like, wherever. And he said, no. I said, you cannot control me. As simple as that. What makes me say that? Imagine someone say, you will never let me change shot of isometric because of my time. It's something in my heart. Like, also, the brothers. In the Bahad Abushin, but that's it. From us, all the Muslims, 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 the Muslims. When you sign like that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written you with me. I can't tell you. I was brought to Guantanamo, chained, shackled, holy, beating, dragged. I had no control. When I left Guantanamo, I refused to leave Guantanamo. Wallahi, I refused. I, I was making istikhara. I didn't want to go to Serbia because Serbia is a bad place. I can't. I don't want to go there. I said, I'm not leaving. I went to the hunger strike. That was they put me in this order too. And they started forcing me. I said, I'm not leaving. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave permission, the peace can happen. No matter what you do. Your time is up. You have to leave now. That's it. They came. They brought the uh, royal team. They would call it the uh, uh, Earth team. Mm -hmm. uh, Extreme reaction force. Yes. So basically, it's like the right team. You see the people who bring the right, uh, right uh, gear. They came, they dragged me, they put me in the sh chain, just let me, restrained me to the stretcher, <laughs> shaped me to Serbia. So I, I don't want to go seriously. I, I, I was ready to stay. I wanted to go to Oman, to the United Arab Emirates, <coughs> to Saudi Arabia, not to Serbia. You know, sometimes when we make istikhara, it's the power of istikhara. The brothers, I was released, forcibly released, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that's it. The brothers who were sent to Saudi Arabia, they went through hard times. And they still under surveillance, wearing those electronic uh, gears. The brothers in the United Arab Emirates have done solitary confinement. The brothers in Oman now are being treated to be deported back. I'm in Serbia, alhamdulillah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always chose a place for them. Zakallah khair, and that's really, um, it's really amazing, subhanAllah, to hear, to, to hear reflections upon the deen itself. Um, so I'm going to be a bit shameless here and, and plug uh, a forthcoming book that you very, very kindly contributed to. Um, it's called When Only God Can See. Um, and it's about the experience of, um, of faith, of prisoners held under the custody of the Americans in both Guantanamo Bay and in the supermax facilities, the political prisoners in the US, but also as a comparison, those prisoners who were held in Egypt. So inshallah, hopefully, this book, uh, I wrote, co-wrote it with Wala Kwesi, um, will be coming out in a few months. But one of, the, one of my favorite chapters in the book, which you contributed to, is, um, the reflections that you, that you brothers have on the Quran. So I was hoping, you know, especially with Ramadan coming up, surprisingly faster than any of us expected. I don't know how the years get shorter in between each Ramadan, but they seem to. Um, could you could you share, you know, one or two reflections that you had on the Quran while you were while you were in prison? <coughs> First of all, when you now read the Quran, you have time to read and to understand. Because the way we pray now, the way we read, we actually become familiar with it. So, in Guantanamo, I we start reflecting everything. The way we pray. But when I come to you, brothers and sisters, please revisit the way you pray. Wallahi, if you go back and understand the meaning of prayer, it will, it it will be your, your I would say, fuel every single day. So at the beginning, was like praying, you know. Uh, Past, very like just I pray. Then, al khushur, God of the Heavenly Name, the Lord of the Salat, the Hashim, like the concentration in prayer. I could pray one hour, start now, like doing classes and pray, uh, explaining about the meaning of the Quran, ayah, and so on. I know you understand now what this means. Tawakkul, you trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the khushur, the pray. So.
10 minutes in front of and we'll go for it, yeah. So, can we talk? Yeah. So basically, I remember when I, I always, when I read Surah Yusuf, and the story of the Islam, it was related to the president. When I started this ayah, I would always cry. That I always give me to. Because I felt, I always start and, and cry at this ayah. Because when I told Yaqub that I'm true, and I said, Inna ma fi wa tuzmiqata, I complain what I'm going to, sadness, and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this ayah always bring tears. When I when brought tears to my eyes, I felt good. So, because before one before one time I had a dream. I had a dream. One of the brothers I said, I dreamt that I was in the same cell with the Sheikh Ma'adrahman, wearing an orange shorts and a, a blue jacket, jeans jackets, and chain. And high laundry in my home. He said, that is making sense. I said, what? He said, you will be a president in the United States. I said, what? He said, but don't worry, it's going to be like a short time, not like Shah Rahman. Shah Rahman was sentenced to 100 years. <laughs> and he's doing like a short time, like 15 years. So sometimes those kind of dreams, you know, we believe in dreams, but we don't make, make any judgment. We just work at it. You know, in front of his family. This is one of the reflections. In Ramadan, you know, the first Ramadan was hard in Guantanamo because away of the family and Ramadan is special in life with our families, you know, the food, the gatherings, like Taraweeh, and so on. First Ramadan, brother remembers, they used to delay the food, the suhoor and the dinner. So suhoor, they would bring it after, uh, sun, after sunrise. The, uh, the dinner, they would bring it, you know, 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, intentionally. And when they would bring the dinner, some brothers would save an apple, fruit, or they would see uh, bread. So then, second day, a brother would send a piece of a bread to a brother, like to make sadaqa with the brothers here. And or they would cut the, the apple with using the strength. I said, Wallahi ali la ilaha illahu, a piece of a bread would travel from person to person until to the, to the, to the sender. So, so that's the, yeah, <laughs> so, Wallah, you have to take it, I swear. It becomes subhanAllah either. And the brother, the, the younger, the oldest brothers, like Wallah, used to eat only one meal a day. Two meals were sent to the younger brothers or the one who starved Allah, the older brothers who eat Allah. And it taught you, you know, a prison is like a special school. So this is one of the uh, reflections we have there. But Allah, Allah, I'm very thankful. Alhamdulillah, we have. Uh, very good brothers, like teaching, and although they took everything from us, but the package we brought with us, because we had no shared life before Guantanamo. At Guantanamo, we start developing a relationship, a common life now. Sharing our memories, our knowledge, experience, emotion, our brain starts constructing a new us. So, we start classes teaching others about cooking the food, about stealing the cars, mafia brothers, just learn, you know. Uh, about <laughs> robbing a bank, about marriage, about cooking, about diving, about helicopter, dancing, <coughs> surgeries. You just share information. Right? Okay. That doesn't mean bad to steal a car, but people have, have time. Learning languages as much as you can. So uh, that's how you know, we start developing a, a shared life will become part of each other uh, life. I'm not going to see any car, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a couple of minutes um, until we need to break. So here's the thing, right? When, when, when atrocities are committed against the West, um, revenge is very much on the agenda. We see masses of backlash. We see thousands of people being killed, detained, tortured, or whatever else. When those same atrocities happen against people of color, then there is almost like this demand of forgiveness that is that is expected. That as the disenfranchised, 
we are under an obligation to prove our humanity by being forgiving to our oppressors. Do you feel an obligation of forgiveness towards those who imprisoned you? I'm sorry, I'm only gonna give you two minutes for this. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I'd like to say, what is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? Okay. And for me, I am not in a position to forgive because I don't own that. It's not about me. You know, it's not it's about you, about you, about you, about you, about all of us, about we were targeting people, our color, our humanity, our religion, our nationality, identity. So we all victims, first of all. Secondly, if there is forgiveness, those people who were killed, entire families erased, they need to bring them back. And we can consult about that, right? If you ask me forgiveness, forgiveness in this matter is justice. This is forgi forgiveness. So if someone told you, oh, I forgive George W. Bush, that means you are a complicit and you are a betrayer. Do you think George Bush has asked forgiveness? Nobody asked forgiveness. And they want to say, oh, I forgive them. No. And I can't and I don't, I will never forgive them unless there's justice. Because this is, has to stop. This is, there must be accountability. Because forgiveness does that mean you can let them to do the same over and over again. I have, alhamdulillah, I have no hate. I have no grudge against anyone. Because every, before in Guantanamo, I made peace with Guantanamo. But I think that forgiveness is justice. So Guantanamo, as you know, was created outside of the legal system outside of the uh, law, outside of the humanity. And from, please, from, <laughs> from 2002, 2010, we call it the dark age, as you shall read in the, uh, the book, where torture, abuse, hunger, star, strike, but also resistance and, uh, in, in, the, in the prison. But more importantly also, we need to talk about before Guantanamo, the black sites where people in prison even worse than Guantanamo. And from 2010, 2013, we call it the golden age, when we negotiated with the Cal administration. You know, we, uh, you know, when Obama sorry, was elected in 2009, he signed an executive order to close Guantanamo, but he failed. So based on that, they improved the living condition in the camps where we have access to classes, art class, uh, family, um, um, family communication, books, TVs, newspaper, and so on that point, I started writing the book in Arabic, then in English. The book was confiscated in 2013 by the FBI. I wrote it as legal letters to my lawyer, my lawyers. That the way the book got out, alhamdulillah. In 2016, I was cleared for release. I was sold to the CIA to be a Qaeda commander and not an insider. 2016, they said, and cleared actually he joined Al Qaeda, and it was a case of mistaken identity. And I told them, no, either he say he's Al Qaeda or not, because I enjoyed being a, being a general. Sometimes they would come in, good morning, sir, the, uh, the official, good morning, sir, how are you, sir? Okay, so I was for civil release, as you know. When I got out from Guantanamo now, after Guantanamo, when I arrived in Serbia, the, the, release, the release between the United States and the Serbian government was a resettlement agreement and all the countries. When I arrived in Serbia, I was told, we have nothing for you. You live in Serbia for two years under restrictions. Now the fun began. You know, Guantanamo has shaped. Mansour is gone now in 441. I told him, well, I'm going to activate 441. So Guantanamo has shaped my mindset, my personality, shaped my behavior. Guantanamo is part of me now. And I told him, you have two choices. I need to talk to at first the Serbian president. He said, you. I said, yes. And I was serious. Because in Guantanamo, I need to speak to the general, or the colonel, to the general or colonel. So, uh, I told them you have two choices. Either to send, send you back to Guantanamo, I find another country. I didn't, I didn't come here to cause problems because I already said, you know, in 2010, subhanAllah, when, when I moved from solitary confinement to a communal living, I was afraid of myself. I would become like empty from within, angry, like just because when someone keep pushing you, you just react, react, react. So what I did, 
when 2010 that we're living, I knew the only way to get out of this situation through education. So I started learning English, reading books as much as I could, alhamdulillah. I was preparing for myself. Even my lawyer tried to get me you know, like in, in, uh, to study college, but anyway, the government, the government refused. When I get out, my man, now I need to go to college. I want to study IT. So my lawyer came from the United States. We managed to rule one of the universities, but the government told the, told the university to expel me, so I was expelled. Why? Because in Guantanamo, the first day I went to the university, they came, they said, we need to talk to you. I said, yeah. I was happy with the bag and books. I have like the, the student index, like small, small uh, books like that. Mm -hmm. So they said, can we see it? I said, yeah, take it. They said, look, sorry, you cannot study here. I said, why? Because Guantanamo. I literally threw my head on the table crying. I said, please, I beg you. Don't take that from me. I said, sorry. I went, I went home crying, you know. That moment, because I really went bad to study that, I left my home country. Then <laughs> I, I needed to leave. I started going, I went on hunger strike for 48 days. Then again, 25 days, I was arrested, beating. I found hidden cameras in my apartment. I took them down. They brought the counterterrorism forces, special forces, wherever. It's online, I think, the interview. So then my lawyer came, sat with the government. We found another faculty. I had no legal status so far, not yet. And one of the, fac the head of the faculty was a nice guy. He, his father was ambassador in South Africa. And I signed a contract that I, will, I didn't have money. I will pay when I get money. Then I started studying, alhamdulillah. I published my first article in the New York Times, two articles. That opened a door for the book, alhamdulillah. In 2018, the government told me you'll be deported to Saudi Arabia prison. Now, turning point. I had to go on hunger strike again. I had no legal status, I had no passport, nothing, I couldn't travel. Short words, alhamdulillah. In 2000, in 2021, I finished my bachelor degree in uh, management, and this is my thesis about rehabilitation and reintegration of former Guantanamo detainees into a social life on the market. <laughs> we created lots of groups. Then, I tried to get a passport so I can leave. Spider tried to help me. I get like a fake passport from people who lied to my brother. We contacted 23 <laughs> agencies around the world. Are you the no, no. He, 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 he tried to help. It's off behavior. So anyway, um, because I, I didn't have money to pay for the passport, I got help anyway. So CIA guys, is my fault anyway. So in 2020, something happened. My lawyer contacted the State Department and contacted the Yemen embassy. Then I get a call one day. Someone, hey, how are you, sir? How are you? I said, fine, who are you? I said, I'm John. What do you want? He said, I'm from the US Embassy and we, uh, we would like to talk to you. I said, are you serious? Like, I said, like, I don't have time for this. I, I have a scam. He said, no, 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 I'm serious. I'm John, please come meet us. We need to talk to you. I said, okay. I called my lawyer and Antonio, you can ask him. And I said, hey, I get that call. What do you think? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I contacted the State Department. I think they will give you a passport or talk to you about the mess, do some talk to you uh, directly. I said, oh, fine. But like, I was a little nervous. I'm not afraid. Ask me why. I'll tell you why. I, she, my lawyer said, hey, please wear that white uh, shirt and the white, white, white the shoes I brought to you. And I have only one set, basically. And she said, be nice because they will judge you by your appearance. And I don't care. She said, do not wear arm. Just go that way. I said, okay, I have a nice jacket, only jacket. One of the brothers sent me clothes, anyway, I'm not gonna say ways. So I wore this like nice pants and nice white shirts, went there. As soon as I got to my apartment, they were following me. I arrived at the embassy, and there's two marines. Hello, I'm Mansour. Yeah, welcome, went there to the room. Someone came, we had a conversation. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. I said, like, you see, man, sophisticated, smart guy, education writing in the New York Times, you know. And I told him, you know, my lawyer told me uh, about the, 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 the meeting, the passports, like, please do not talk to anyone about that. I said, okay, <laughs> it's too late for that. So he said, uh, I told him I need the passport and so on, and he said, don't worry. You need the passport, money, travel, you know, 
So, yeah, I said, don't worry. Why don't you get your passport, money, and you'll be able to travel. I said, okay. I said, yes, we need to be partners to work together. Oh, Habibi, <laughs> the secret here. I told him, I can't, you know. He said, you know, well, I said, like, he said, why? I said, of course, against my religion. He said, you know, there is some scholars and shiuch give fatwa that's, you know, like, balance. And it's permissible. We are not doing, we respect Islam and, you know, that you can still pray, blah, 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 blah. I said, look, I don't want to go to hell. Simple, simple as that. <laughs> we had a conversation then. By the end of our conversation, John was kind enough. He gave me 200 euro for the taxi inside the envelope. I still keep it here. I always <laughs> hang it in my wall. So thank you, John. The taxi cost only one ten euro, and it, it's not that he tried. To, it's just because we bring you here to pay for the taxi. Thank you. So, alhamdulillah, I didn't get my passport. I was engaged to a woman. I couldn't get married anyway. Um, uh, alhamdulillah. Last year, in 2023, yeah, December 28, I got my passport. Back here. Sweetheart, here. You know, I struggle a lot. Then, after I published my book, I become known activism and so on. I worked for many NGOs, free work, alhamdulillah. People ask me, how do you do that? I, work, I do this work, all my problems are solved, alhamdulillah. Because I help my brothers, Allah is, uh, uh, is my, my uh, problem. So the way I get my passport, Wallahi, <coughs> uh, the ambassador changed the one who was blocking my passport. The Yemen president changed. I'm not saying because of me. It's, it's sometimes the weight, and there is something I need to balance. <coughs> and I get my, alhamdulillah, 20 NGOs wrote to Yemen embassy in the United States. They said, if you don't give him his passport, we are going to, to come and make some demonstration protest. And alhamdulillah, eventually I get my passport. So far I have traveled five, six countries and invited to the, I organized one of the biggest conferences about Guantanamo at the uh, European Parliament. I have visited Irish Parliament, UK Parliament, with Chris Law, so it's a lot of blood there. So anyway, Allahumma alhamdi Allah, this is Mullah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know. Uh, last, I had finished my master's degree, preparing my thesis, which is about closing Guantanamo. Again, after them, I'm not gonna give up. Uh, last year, we signed a contract uh, with Amazon, Audible book, wait for it, please. It's called Letters from Guantanamo. And inshallah, we'll be published next September. Work on a new book, a next book to that called Life After Guantanamo, a film and a TV show, inshallah. Everything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma alhamdulillah. And my mom pray a lot. She sent me messages. Always praying, alhamdulillah. And I am so happy that someone behind me, my mom, my dad, and each of you is behind me. I can tell you, all of you supported us. All of you prayed for us. All of you donated for us. Where we want to So in behalf of myself and other want to thank you all, all of you. Seriously, to all uh, people, Muslims, all the people, because when we were there, we when we heard that people protested for us, we felt the best of <coughs> people connected to us, give us hope, challenge us for the dead place of really matters. Alhamdulillah, we, we got some letters and about the protest, people got arrested, go on hunger strike, and so on. So, exactly, khair jami'an, and thank you so much, and Allah bless you all. We have a, a tendency to think that the point of release is the point of relief. And that is um, the biggest lie that we can tell ourselves. The real hard work for the release detainees begins the very second they leave the prison camps. Prison life is very unique, especially in such an uh, unlawful form that something like Guantanamo takes where you as an innocent person are subjected to torture, to interrogation, to dehumanization and demonization on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. So you, you go into this resistance mode throughout the entirety of that experience and you have a, a routine that develops. You have a relationship with Allah that is magnified 
and you speak to any of the prisoners, they will tell you that our Iman was never as high in our life as it was while we were in prison. And then you are released and the real world hits you. Then family life takes over and you have to get a job and you are subject to all of the fear of the societies that you live in. And it's very, very hard. Mansoor, by Allah's fadl, has uh, acquired this character and this amazing spirit that has helped him to carry through it. But don't be fooled by the smile. It's been hard, very, very hard for him, as well as, well as all of the brothers. Even the strongest, even the ones who are writing brilliant books and you know giving incredible speeches, they suffer. And because we're close to them, we see that suffering. Many people don't. And so I don't want anybody to go away from, from today thinking that this is the end of our journey. Even if every single Guantanamo Bay detainee is released, the work continues because the, the, the impact of torture is lingering for many, many, many years after the point of release comes. So our work from Guantanamo has to continue. And so just for those, those few remarks, I just wanted to kind of give us that reminder, but I, I, I wanted to open the floor for uh, a few people to, to ask some questions of Mansoor. Well, first I want to say that your book is brilliant. Thank you. I give it as a gift to everybody. I've already bought 100 copies. Everybody <laughs> should buy as many as you can afford, and if you can't afford one, I'll buy it for you tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you, Cage, for hosting this which is fantastic. I am disappointed that there are not a thousand people here instead of 60 and that there are not, you know, more than 10% non-Muslims because your message should resonate to the whole humanity. And the more it's communicated, the better it is. I could ask you a hundred questions, but I just want to, I guess, that pick, would be an pick, now. Pick, up, <laughs> pick up on what you're saying, which is different from what I was going to ask you, but about your life afterwards was so interesting that I thought I'd just pick on that. You are innocent, you are released as innocent. Why was it so difficult, you're now talking to Parliament and stuff, why was it so difficult for countries to take you, accept you, integrate you, welcome you? Why were your other brothers so badly treated in Saudi, Oman, UAE, etc.? I mean, that is almost as difficult to understand as some of the things that happen in Guantanamo, if you know what I mean. because. It's just nuts. Great. I mean, welcome you, work, give you work, welcome your other brothers, make up for the errors that were made. I'm shocked. <laughs> you know, life after Guantanamo, we call it Guantanamo 2.0. Because what, the moment the prisoners released, or released from Guantanamo, it was a classified agreement between the United States and the hosting government. Each country received budget for the prisoners. But there was, there is no kind of rehabilitation or reintegration program, especially in countries like United Arab Emirates, Kazakhstan, Serbia, and others. Especially when uh, the agreement just the, the focus is in the security issue. So the stigma and there is a money involved. There was no kind of like condition to rehabilitate and reintegrate. And especially at the time when Trump took over, he closed the office in the State Department managing the release cases, it becomes chaos. And there is no any kind of people who monitor the, 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 the prisoners who were released from Guantanamo. We end up lost. Some prisoners end up in prison, some of them end up dying because uh, they, they didn't have access to health care. Some of them are still in prison in the United Arab Emirates until that day. Uh, some prisoners were deported back from Senegal to Libya and end up tortured, abused. Some prisoners live in without legal status, live in limbo. And all the cases, I have worked closely with the brothers and sisters from Cage. I have been working on these cases since I got out. Contacted with NGOs, Cage, lawyers, activists. We managed to resolve some of the cases. And when we tried to get the State Department involved, they don't want to get involved. They said, well, it's not our problem. That happened with me too in 2018 when the Serbian government wanted to deport me back to Saudi Arabia, so they are in Saudi prison. My lawyer, I was lucky, I had a lawyer, I had a very good lawyer. She flew from the United States to Serbia. She's talked to the 
a European delegation who will stop my, my dep deportation. But for what? I understand. You are living a life, you're going about, you've got your girlfriend. What do they want to deport you for? What are you doing? They don't want you there. Simple as that. They got the money, they don't want to be responsible for you. And from, this, from their view, the Serbian will tell me, you are a terrorist. You know, when you are a general. When my lawyer told him, they said, no. You know, the, when she told him the agreement, she's like, do you have a written agreement? So it was a classical agreement. There was no one to enforce this kind of agreement. Just to get rid of you. That's it. They're not safe when to get rid of you. In Guantanamo, they told me, we cannot simply say, we detain, we detain an innocent man for, for around 15 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Jahan? Yes, just quickly on um, your Habibi, Ron De Sanchez. Oh yeah. Well, well, let's, let's give some context first. Yes. So Republican nominee DeSantis has dropped out of the race. And I get like emails. So DeSantis DeSantis was in Guantanamo in two thousand six. One of the worst years in Guantanamo. And when they it's a long story, but <coughs> we were tortured in the force feed. And I remember we he was behind the fence when they insert a thick tube to my nose and there was a lot of pouring a lot of insure through the, the the bottles to our stomach before that he was talking to a nice man before that and they were standing behind the the fence i was in the force feeding chair tied like that only my my only my eyes move every point of my body was restrained i was screaming shouting cursing bleeding it was too much like just their mission to break the hunger strike they were standing like that. You know, he was uh, wearing the uniform, the sunglasses. I, I, as I'm looking at him now, uh, and my stomach was really small in the hunger strike. So yeah. I, I threw up, just I dragged it through the like, it kept like fountain. As soon as the, I hit him, wallahi, well, they just jump up. He looked like the sunglasses, the head, like this disgusted. That was the best scene I ever had. <laughs> so, we, in 2020, I found him on Twitter, and uh, I put his, uh, I took a download his photo, put it on the WhatsApp group chat. I guess we have, for, for, from a good time, the thing is, I would say, well, recognize him. And the brother, son of a blah, 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 like that, so, like, I said, okay. Then I just tweeted about him, also Sheikh Faisal Kandri yeah. tweeted about him too. Then, just that, as simple as that, you know, I took my lawyer, I knew that person, said, yeah, said, yeah, he was there. Then some, one of the, <coughs> Iraqi veterans who become very activist. His uh, name is <coughs> Mike Bresner. He said, Mansoor, we would like to go on a podcast. I said, why not? So we did a podcast about 2006, the force feeding, the hunger strike. It became viral. Then one of the investigative journalists from the Washington Post contacted me. And everyone was afraid. He said, like, you know, this guy is his name Michael, Michael Kernish. He's, he's well known and like, he's going to. You know, be sure, I said, I'm sure. And my lawyer told me, look, if you're going to talk about that person, they will come after you. They will not look around. I said, I don't care. <laughs> so we did, you know, someone who's very, uh, an investigative journalist, do a lot of work. Hard questions, back and forth, spend hours talking. Then, and he said, I believe you. Because in 2018, he admitted that he was there when the hunger strike, and he gave advices how to, he said, he told me in the video, he said, those detainees would go on jihad, but they wouldn't hunger strike. I was asked, uh, the com commander asked me how to uh, c uh, c combat that. I said, here are the rules, you can force fit. And by his tone, 2023, he, he uh, denied that. It's right there. Then we did a, a documentary about him, like with Vice News, Association Press. I wrote a article about him in Al Jazeera. The documentary was published in, in, the, in the 28th of May, 20, uh, two hours later was uh, canceled by Paramount. And I wrote about that. They wanted to protect him. The New York Times came after me. They published a long article. You read it, right? Yes. I did. So attacking me, there are other four, four other brothers who actually recognize him. And they were interviewed by different media and newspaper. And they just targeted me. Long article. They said, I'm not. I feel happy that they came after me because <laughs> They get hurt. So this is the story. So around the sense, Habibi, I know how you feel now. Just, you know, uh, if you need any help, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, brother. 
Uh, first of all, Guantanamo, for me, is a gift. Allahumma alhamdulillah. Allah. If time come would happen, I would do it again. But I don't want anyone to go through it. Because I know I could handle it. I know I do the lot to help myself, my brothers, and so on. It helped me because of Guantanamo. I'm talking to you today. At the same time, if they created a hundred Guantanamo, a million Guantanamo, torture abuses, then they're not going to, to break me or tame me or change me. Not us. You know, we are more powerful, we are more stronger. You know, the worst moments of Guantanamo were the death of my, uh, some of my brothers. You know, this is one of the worst. Alhamdulillah, we say Alhamdulillah, but you know, when you hear it one day, one night, that you, you miss some of your close brothers, friends, this is the thing still haunting until that day, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and alhamdulillah, you know, but still, you know, sometimes I feel guilty. I left a life and they left in a coffin. Yeah, but my Allah accepted my Allah have mercy on them all, alhamdulillah. I mean, but for me, but that mean like I'm weak or waking me, we at some point are going to deport this life. We, we all, we all leave it. You know, sometimes at Guantanamo, I would imagine myself in the moon and look at earth, what I could see. I saw it be like water and a rock. And I imagine there is a gate left and a gate right. And our mission in this life to walk from that gate to that gate. And we are leaving anyway. Now what matters how we live? What we have made, we, we, what we have sent there to life after. But alhamdulillah, you know, uh, this, is, this is Guantanamo. Uh, make me who I am. Alhamdulillah, I'm better, stronger. Yes, Brother Farouk. Brother Mamad, I'm not sure if I missed the first, <coughs> the first part of the talk, so forgive me. We were in Afghanistan. Afghans loved their weapons. Yemenis, I think, also loved their weapons. We see in the news that you guys wear a big, uh, lovely dagger in your belts. Yeah. So what was the similarities for you between the Afghan uh, character and uh, the Yemeni character? We are Muslims characters. I mean, like, I don't want to not Muslims, basically, sorry. Uh, I mean, like, no offense. Uh, we all tribe, society, people with tradition, customs, live by tribe code, and so on, struggle, mm -hmm. poverty, but that doesn't mean people live with integrity, courage, and, uh, and uh, transparency, transparency, and so on. Alhamdulillah, you know. Uh, as for the weapon, when the interrogator you asked me, have you ever had a weapon? I said, yeah. Who's training us? My grandma. Was she in Afghanistan? <laughs> <laughs> Was she Al Qaeda? <laughs> so actually, it's our tradition. You know, carrying a weapon, it's not like being a bad or so on. For us, it's part of our, of our identity, of our, uh, of our uh, <coughs> clothing, our tradition, and so on. So, yeah, Alhamdulillah, when you look even in a state, one of the arguments with the interrogator is like, we disarm Yemenis. I said, I said look. I told them in United States you have around 84,000 uh, shell of weapon and you have like around 360 million pieces of weapon. In Yemen we have 60 million. And you take it from us. That's not fair. How do you get this to statistics? Because uh, after 2010 we had like newspaper and so on. Basically, there's a lot of similarities, you know, between those tribes. And as you see, inshallah, they. Afghani defeat the Americans, and the uh, uh, Americans are uh, planning to invade Yemen. I think, inshallah, they will get the second victory too. We're not wishing for the war, but you know, alhamdulillah. Okay, so we have time for one last question and one quick answer, Akhi Yeah, Hamza. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted, do you read the other memoirs, like Mozambique's enemy combatant, Guantanamo Diary? Did you have access to it in Guantanamo? No, the no. First no, this classified, high classified, you know. We didn't we have access to any kind of books about Guantanamo. And about what's unique about that book, not because I wrote it, it was my book. That book covers around 20 years of Guantanamo life, and it takes you inside Guantanamo, about like prisoners, guards, 
Guantanamo and the life, loves and uh, everything there, basically. If you read it, if you, if you, if you are not satisfied, and read it, then we'll refund you. <laughs> <laughs> Mansoor will privately refund you. <laughs> but first, you have to find a way to read it, so basically. Uh, only only because it's Saeed, I'll, I'll allow him more. Yeah. Sound, 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 sound. I should, I should say, sisters, uh, does anybody have a question? Because it's been a bit quiet from your end. No? At least one question. Okay, here we go. Yes, please. I just want to ask about learning language, learning English. I mean, you're English. I'm a teacher. I teach English. And what English is incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I'm, <laughs> I'm holding myself a little. I, I learn with the guards, you know, the way I learn English, communicating with the guards. Then I develop my own technique. What I used to do, I found some of the brothers, they memorized like 5,000, 6,000 words, but they cannot speak the language. So what I did, I would write a full sentence, every day five sentences, <laughs> use them, repeat that. By the end of the week, I would go through them again, write them again. So what I did, it was like taking a ready meal and set to my brain, so it doesn't have time to go through grammar, through construction and so on, and that helped me greatly. So I started also teaching at Guantanamo. It is Baraka, Wallahi. When I, I, I was, learning and teaching at the same time and encouraging everyone to learn English, learn English. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Also, always I say, Allah, help me, help me. So, so what walked me through that is was dua. Dua. I can tell you, dua in many, many, many occasions. Until that day, Allah, alhamdulillah. If something hard, difficult, I just, oh Allah, please, I'm here, I have this problem, you know, I, I need your help, you have everything. So, Allah, alhamdulillah. But also like resistance, you know, with education, with, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm finished college education, I'm a master, I'm going to PhD, and inshallah, bi Allah Thank you. Yes. Uh, so that brings our, uh, our no, wait, please. Oh. Thank you, uh, sir, so much. You talked in the book about the Red Cross visiting and how useless they were. Can we just talk <laughs> real quick about why, and why, about how, how they were useless? And why do you think that was? You know, I remember when uh, one of the newspaper, my, my lawyer sent in uh, <coughs> Rumsfeld, the secretary of the Department, of the Department of Defense was asked, he said, that if there was something wrong at Guantanamo, the ICRC will speak. So the ICRC witnessed everything from the beginning, black side, torture, and did nothing. So we told them, guys, being here, it, it gives legitimacy to Guantanamo. You shouldn't be here. Because Guantanamo was created outside of the law of the justice system, outside the international, nothing applies at Guantanamo. Imagine you hear that the, the ICRC is like the international uh, community of the Red Cross, like that makes sure that prisoners treated humanely according to Geneva Convention, but Guantanamo, the torture, the abuses, the waterboarding was there. And they did, not, they, they did nothing. They tried to actually to cover their eyes. Well, I remember in, two, remember in 2009, I was in Fort Speedy. I was in Alpha Block, downstairs, during the visit of the ICRC, they would hide us, because they didn't want ICRC to, 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 to see us. So Hatim Sudani, from Sudan, he walked by, and he saw me in the cell while be, being forced He walked, he just did like this. I said, Hatim, he said, I cannot see you like that. I'm not allowed. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm not allowed to see you like that. You know. So basically, they were just, you know, cover up for the American crimes, ICRC is there. Simple as that. That way would get, what the boy, boy get them and ask, him to, ask them to leave. ICRC gave legitimacy to Guantanamo. Are they bought? Have they been bought? No, not bought, you know. You're not, the, the fund come to the United Nations 
50, more than 50% by the United States. So what I found you, I can control you, right? Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Thank you, thank you for, for all the questions, everybody, and for you, to you, Mansoor, for you know sharing your story with us um, and inspiring us in so yeah, many ways. Yeah, I'd like to say before we, uh, I'm going to sing. I always sing for people like the, the song at Guantanamo. We used to sing. I'm going to sing it for for all of you and for the brothers. So Guantanamo singing was a way to resist, <laughs> and we we imagine one of like there was like different nationalities would sing in different languages, Arabic, English, Urdu, Farsi. Uh, the Uyghur brothers, we have one of Uyghur brothers who just sang, uh, sing like uh, Major Michael Jackson. They used to call him the white, the white Michael Jackson. So when a brother, uh, and like the story of singing is really beautiful. So when, the, when someone would leave Guantanamo or leave the block or go to the interrogation or appointment, would say, Ruh, Ruh, Ma'a Salama, Allah Yazidak, Amnu Salama, Ruh, Ruh, Ma'a Salama, Allah Yazidak, Amnu Salama. It means, go, go with peace, may Allah grant you peace and safety. Imagine 50, 100, 150 people sing at the same time. It's like a thunder. Ruh, Ruh, Ma'a Salama. Some of the guards, the new guards, look scared, afraid. <laughs> so, what I say, go, go with peace, may Allah grant you more, more peace and safety. Jazakumullah khair, asallah al kareem al kareem yuhum al nar, wa ni hukum jami'an. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let's go for book signing. MashaAllah, jazakumullah khair, everybody.